Okay. All right, welcome. Again, I'm Kat Cortez, the comms lead at the Open Data Charter and your host for the Open Data Open House Asia and Oceania sesh session. Um, all right, so just a little bit of an intro. Uh, the Open Data Charter began at the margins of a United Nations General Assembly meeting in 2015. It will be our eighth anniversary in September. We collaborate with over 170 governments and organizations working to open up data based on a shared set of principles. I'll get back to these principles in a minute. Um, we also promote policies, practices, as well as tools that enable governments and CSOs to collect, share, and use well-governed data to respond effectively to our focus areas, which are data rights, anti-corruption, climate action, and we have work and gender, previously in pay equity, and more recently in the care economy. We've also started some research and surveys in AI as well, which you may have seen on our Twitter. So for more information on how you can join us to create more of a community, especially in this region, as an adopter or endorser of the International Open Data Charter Principles, visit www.opendatacharter.org. Okay, I will share some links later. Okay, so speaking of and going back to the shared set of principles, there are six, but instead of listing them or sharing a slideshow, I encourage you to check out our Twitter where we have an ongoing mini campaign that answers the questions, why is open data for everyone? Why is open data for governments? Um, so we answer those questions, they're two separate colored uh, Twitter cards, um, oh, by applying, just admit, by applying or clarifying the principles in those contexts. Um, and why open data open house? So we're here first and foremost to celebrate and be a part of open day to day, which was officially just earlier this month, but we decided why not celebrate the whole month? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, this was inspired uh, largely by our implementation working group where we convene monthly, and share open data trends, best practices, uh, but lately we've, we've been focusing on agreed upon themes. And unfortunately, these meetings have not been kind to all the time zones uh, and our board members who are present uh, know this. Uh, so we decided because we have different team members located in different time zones, why not we each try to host a session? So I'm located in Singapore at the moment, but uh, mostly remain in Southeast Asia. So good to meet all of you. Please again, introduce yourselves uh, if you've just come in. So the LATAM and the Europe Africa session wrapped up last week. And after today, we just have one more session left. That's a North American session led by PEC and I'll share links later. Um, so as mentioned, we don't have a lot of regular communication with it, Asia and Oceania uh, community. And so would really like to kick that off. So more context uh, for the discussion today, our five speakers will be sharing key open data activities in the past year, success and or challenges, something to celebrate, uh, hello, <laughs> something to celebrate, something to improve, something to look forward to, or key reflections and recommendations in the open data community. So I'll share this in case anyone else wants to join and chime in with their updates in the chat. Here's the chat. Okay. And rules of engagement before we get started. One, please make sure you're muted when someone is presenting. Um, we did want this to be an informal sharing session, but you know how Zoom works and it's not kind to overlapping conversations. <laughs> if you have any questions, do type them in the chat. I will keep track of them and we'll set aside some time after the sharing including if anyone else in the audience wants to speak. Um, okay, uh, important third rule of engagement, please help me look out for uninvited or disruptive guests. I may be too focused on hosting to realize. But more important than that is, I encourage you to screen cap the discussion and help to live tweet, or if you prefer to post a tweet after, that's great. Uh, I am the comms uh, person for Open Data Charter. So as you know, usually I'm the one doing the live tweeting when my colleagues are presenting. Um, so that would help, uh, but please be mindful of anyone who does not want to be a part of the recording or is not showing themselves on video and kindly focus on the speakers or those with their camera on. Okay, so without further ado, let's get the discussion started. First, we have uh, Nikesh Balami, 
who is uh, the co-founder of Open Knowledge Nepal and one of ODC's uh, board members. Uh, Nikesh, you have the floor. You uh, might be familiar with Nikesh if you've had an Open Data Day uh, event. <laughs> Welcome, well, Nikesh. Thank you, thank you, Get. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's good to see a lot of like, uh unknown face uh, uh so uh, so I, I i have a brief presentation prepared uh definitely not covering all the questions that uh cat mentions but uh, just briefly highlighting what uh we from open knowledge nepal have been doing and some of the some of the learnings around it so i'll quickly share that and uh, later in the discussion since as cat previously mentioned let's make it very informal so that we can discuss some regional context too so uh quickly sharing my screen Okay, I you can see my screen, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so we're just uh, briefly talking about the open knowledge and open data momentum here in Nepal. So, uh, yeah. so uh, like as as Kat mentions, my name is Nikesh Palami. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Knowledge Nepal. And uh, recently, I also joined Open Knowledge Foundation as an international open data lead, uh, leading the Open Data Day projects. Uh, and some of the uh, community related activities around around it uh, and uh, I'm, I'm also the board member of open data chartered uh, that like currently we are like uh, discussing around it uh, so talking about open all this nepal we are the uh, global network using definitely advocacy and technology to open up open up knowledge and we build tools and communities around it so uh, as like steven is also here we uh, build tools around uh, seek and frictionless communities and uh, uh, like uh, shared and use open knowledge for better goods. And one of our like key philosophy is to uh, believe that the openness is the openness of data is very powerful in order to like have participatory governance, civil society eventually leading to the uh, sustainable development thing. Uh, what we do uh, from Open Knowledge Nepal, uh, like from overall Open Knowledge Foundation too, uh, we work on uh, training and capacity building programs uh, teaching people about the importance of open data, mm -hmm. how to innovate uh, using using the data thing. Uh, we also provide specialized training service. So, for example, if some local government, central governments, or uh, civil society are looking for uh, supports in terms of data visualization, data analysis, mm -hmm. or building some some level of DMS softwares using SIGANS or some other uh data related tools we provide technical service around it and uh we also work on research analysis kinds of stuff so we have been part of uh global data parameters uh, some global research too and we have been like also uh researching uh, the context of open data data ecosystem here in nepal too uh so what do we do so basically i just wanted to like share this a uh, link to this our project website where we uh, try to incubate few bits of projects around around it. So how been doing? Uh, how we have been doing it? So uh, we have been like running grassroots awareness campaign, which is very important when it comes about South Asian Sorry, regions. Sorry, Sorry, but your slides aren't loading for me. I'm not sure uh, with everyone else. Uh, just uh, it's it's okay. just a loading screen for us. I did, sorry to interrupt you, but um, from, from the very beginning. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'll uh, quickly share my screen once again. No worries. Ah, uh, okay. It's loading Perfect. now. Okay, yes. sorry. Uh, mobile probably because of the internet thing. Uh, so uh, like how when uh, how we have been doing it definitely about uh, running grassroots awareness campaign and also uh using civic tech to like open up our data. So I just wanted like quickly highlight a couple of the projects that we have been doing. Uh, so these are all incubated projects. We have been like uh, testing few bits and here and there to see how our data, the available data can be better used and reused. Uh, so uh, so we we did uh, this project uh, a couple of years ago and we've been like running this, uh, which is Open Data Nepal. So it's a CCAN based uh, 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 civil society open data platform. So uh, through this platform, we really wanted to like set an examples of like how uh, the open source uh, DMS tool like C can be, can be used uh, in terms of data management thing uh, to build uh, uh, the the good interoperable uh, data data ecosystem within within the country. 
and I think these examples can be very. Um, so I think, I, I, as I see in in different regional contexts too, I think uh, Sikkim has been like used uh, for for building a lot of like op op like open data platform or data management platform all all around the region. So uh, so this has been one of the like successful incubated projects here in Open Open Knowledge Nepal as we crowdsource lots of. Uh, government data, which has been silos in uh, different like line ministries, different like websites, different documents kinds of stuff. So we basically use volunteers uh, who are like interested in like contributing the data ecosystem and like build those scattered data uh, in, in one dedicated open data platform and uh, make sure that the researchers or, or uh, some hackers around it uh, can, can use this data to build something innovative. So this has been one good case study. Uh, so another uh, uh, another things that we have been testing is this Ax Nepal platform. So basically, it's a right to information no a right to information uh, platform where uh, citizen can use this platform to make uh, a request freedom of information request uh, within different public authorities. So uh, this is also based in open source platform. For example, Open Data Nepal is based on CCAN platform. So this is based on Elevated platform, which is uh, developed by my society. So it's a very uh, easy to deploy platform where uh, and, and, and can be customized according to the country needs or, or the regional needs. So uh, so I definitely would like to like encourage everyone to like go through and check this out. And uh, recently we jumped into like uh, supporting lots of uh, government, local government too. So and uh, like basically promoting the use of CCAN uh, in in all the best way possible mm -hmm. thing. So uh, so we have been like developing uh, these kinds of like integrated data management system platform for different local governments here in Nepal. And uh, this is one of the examples uh, where we supported one uh, local municipalities here in Nepal in terms of like integrating the different MS system uh, that has been that has been like there in the municipalities inside this. For example, there is a different. Uh, I think this is the uh, si similar situation for lots of other countries too. But uh, for example, like education ministry has their own MS, health ministry has their own MS thing. And like, uh, for example, one particular local government might have like around 10 to 15 MS system uh, running throughout the municipality kinds of stuff. So, uh, so through this integrated platform, uh, we are trying to like, uh, bring the data developed by de generated by those MS system in the single platform and make it available for uh, municipality staff too and for the general public too, so that uh, uh, it can be the 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 more accountable and transparent ecosystem can be well uh, promoted. And uh, since uh, climate has been the very very hot topics around the regions and Nepal has been like one uh, one of the vulnerable countries. We are also uh, incubating uh, the climate knowledge portal. So uh, basically, this system uh, is it's like we we wanted to like make it more like low cost thing uh, without any investment kind of stuff. So basically, we are just using GitHub uh, pages features uh, and 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 the GitHub to like power this uh, climate knowledge portal. We where we are like trying to like curate the resources, data, the stakeholders around the climate. Uh, around the climate so that everyone can like come together when it comes about like uh, reusing the climate data or using the uh, uh, climate data for for better decision making kinds of stuff so this is in a very initial stage uh, since we are not from the climate expert domain uh, we are trying our best to like link up with uh, people or stakeholders working on climate uh, things to uh, collaborate on this so just to highlight this brief uh, process and challenges kind of stuff. So how we have been doing it and the types of challenges uh, that we have seen uh, around leading this open data and open knowledge momentum here in Nepal. So in terms of talking about the process, so uh, three things that we we believe that we clearly learned is uh, definitely about decentralizing the campaign. So rather than focus on focusing on a couple of cities areas. Uh, or within the Kathmandu region, we are trying our best to like reach uh, local governments or the rural area as much as possible so that uh, this momentum get uh, better inclusivity uh, participants. So not focusing on the uh, cities area, but definitely decentralizing the campaigns all, all around the countries. 
localizing the resources. So when you talk about open data or open knowledge, I think there are there has been a lot of global resources produced. So rather than investing more money on producing the similar kinds of knowledge or resources, we uh, use those uh, resources to like localize localize and and promote the momentum here in Nepal and. Uh, creating more human resources so hardly a uh, few people understand uh, when you like pitch about open data so I think more more human resource needs to be uh, synthesized so that's how we have been doing it so uh, decentralizing the campaign localizing the resources and like creating more human resources who can like better understand or use open data here in Nepal uh, in terms of challenges so definitely I think this has been the one of the like critical challenges here in South Asian region. So education diversity and digital literacy. So so the, there is no balance between uh, the education so and and then the and the digital literacy too. So uh, this has been the one of the like big hurdles here, uh, and and definitely the uh, frequent communications and like continuous follows or follow up is also very important. For example. Uh, when you talk about the open data, the open data projects or open data, uh, uh, like resources kinds of stuff. So, uh, so it's just one level of communication never worked out. So, uh, the continuous follow follow up has been very, uh, much needed. And uh, last but not the least, uh, the unsigned improvement, uh, like improper <laughs> improvisations because, uh, like we we go with one one level of mindsets or one level of like. Uh, project design but sometimes when you reach out to the different cities or different work with different stakeholders so the improvisation is very much needed in terms of like how we portray this uh things uh, uh with with them so uh so, uh so there are there are a couple of challenges and there are a couple of ways that we are trying to mitigate mitigate kinds of stuff uh uh in terms of like how we look forward uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, carrying out this momentum is definitely about more about uh, uh, building up, building out more regional collaboration around it so that uh, the learnings or the knowledge can be like widely shared and also building the case studies in terms of like how data can be used uh, because like uh, the continuous advocacy, just defining open data or the data momentum hasn't been that successful because like uh, like uh, after all, like people will ask us about, okay, we open up the data now, what kinds of stuff. So uh, maybe the building the case studies around like using climate data for some level of uh, better decision making or for uh, advocacy kinds uh, as been has been some uh, like important kinds of things uh, that we look forward um, uh, to like to to hop in or like to to enhance uh, from from uh, moving forward points. Uh, so back, with that being said, I think uh, this has been a like, brief presentation of like what we have been doing and what we think uh, we'll continue doing it. So yeah, thank you everyone. So and look for looking forward to the discussion to you. Thank you, Nikesh. Uh, yeah, we will deep dive into the challenges and all of that uh, later. Um, uh, great to hear from you. Our next uh, speaker is Ivy Gail Ong, Open Data Partnership. Uh, acting regional lead Asia and the Pacific. You have the floor. I mean. Thanks, Kat. Just clarifying that I'm from Open Government Partnership. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Although open I would government. say I am I am also with you on open data because I got into OGP when I was still in government, launching an open data initiative for national government in the Philippines. So I know full well how hard it is to build this and also to build a community a constituency around it so very lovely to be back in you know the place where I started uh before I got into you know open gov all right so I'll, I'll keep this brief because I want to really hear more about the the practitioners from the practitioners themselves and have you know more conversation for sure so just a brief background on what OGP is, because I don't know if everyone knows. OGP, um, Open Government Partnership, if I think about it, it's just it's a simple but very powerful goal. We want governments to truly serve and empower their citizens. And the vision really is for governments to become more transparent, more accountable, more responsive to their own citizens, um, really just putting the power back to citizens. 
formally launched in 2011, we have eight founding governments. So that's Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Norway, Philippines, South Africa, UK, and the US, and nine civil society organizations. So it's really a co-owned partnership, and we've bloomed into 75 countries, uh, 75 governments, uh, 106 locals, thousands of civil society uh, joining, and even uh, development partners. So from the get-go, OGP really has embraced open data uh, policies and practices ever since 2011. Uh, and as we all know in this room, in a functional democracy, it's crucial for citizens to have knowledge of government actions. And in doing so, this requires that citizens have free access to government data and have the ability to reuse, use, republish, share. Uh, if I just look at OGP data, 115 members across uh, at when we just started um, have 1,112 commitments on open data. But if I go into Asia Pacific, and when I say Asia Pacific, I only focus on the members of OGP. So that's Australia, Indonesia, Kyrgyz Republic, Mongolia, New Zealand, Philippines, Republic of Korea, and Sri Lanka. Uh, there have been 99 commitments related to open data ever since 2011. However, only 16% of those commitments have shown early results in opening up government, meaning changing the way things have worked. This is unfortunately below global average. And the number of commitments, if you look at the trend, and I'm happy to share the, the dashboard and you can play around our data, uh, over here, our commitment data. Um, there has been a, there was a peak in the first three to five years for in of open data commitments in OGP, and then it started to plateau and even go down. Uh, it's gone down by thirty three percent since twenty twenty. Open data related commitments have shown early results in opening up governments. So focusing on beneficial ownership, on enhancing public service delivery, uh, increasing access to government information, including budgets, transparency, and, and transparency in political party finance. The highlights I want to mention here, if we look at the trends uh, in our own data in the eight countries that I mentioned, data availability varies by policy area. If I look if we look at most of the OGP countries in Asia and the Pacific, a huge chunk has published public procurement as a huge number of them uh, who have regularly done that, asset disclosure, land ownership and tenure, and rulemaking. Um, the flag I will provide though here is the published data typically lacks high value information and usability. So data sets in the region generally do not include important details such as common identifiers to link multiple data sets. The other finding is that many countries um, lack publicly available data on key areas to counter political corruption. So recently we, we have a uh, report called Broken Links using um, data from the Global Data Barometer. Uh, our team uh, from the Analytics and Insights team looked into how open data is being used um, to counter corruption. And the finding is where countries do publish data, making this data available to the public in an open format remains a challenge. In most areas, a small minority of countries publish data in a machine-readable format, which prevent in, in not in a machine readable format, so it prevents um, further analysis uh, for monitoring and accountability purposes. But across nearly all the policy areas, uh, a gap exists between the number of countries with legal frameworks that require data collection and the countries with laws requiring data publication. So they found we found especially that there are big gaps for beneficial ownership and lobbying. Uh, only Australia has a law to govern the collection and publication of lobbying data, for example. One success, though, and one thing I won't leave you with the challenges, uh, countries here have really advanced reforms through OGP in certain areas of anti-corruption policy. So I mentioned open uh, public procurement information. You would have seen that also in, in the link that I've shared. There are certain countries who have also made a lot of progress on political finance. Um, 
I also have seen South Korea, Seoul, South Korea, that has used um, policies, has used open data to make it more responsive to the needs of citizens. So they designed subway maps that highlighted the easiest route for persons with disabilities, for the elderly and pregnant women to reach an elevator. So their indoor spatial information system enables that, uh, and all because of a mom seeing her daughter have a difficult time navigating subways. Uh, so that's, um, again, ground up. But then also we've seen uh, open data being used to increase access to information to government decision-making processes. Um, Philippines publishing geolocated data on infrastructure projects, including type, cost, status, uh, in their own uh, participatory budgeting portal. Um, Armenia and South Korea also published government data um, to enable them to influence public policies, to enhance public services. But just noting that there is a focus also on climate. Um, there are, we've also seen a bit of work around this one, uh, supporting environmental management efforts by making information about environmental conditions, pollution, and resource use available to stakeholders. So Chile recently made all climate-related public investments for adaptation, mitigation, or both transparent using open data standards as part of their biannual reporting process on implementing their COVID recovery plan. So the idea is for it to be a transparent and participatory working group to review the classification and measurement of public expenditures for reporting. Indonesia has done this by combining their beneficial ownership commitment um, and focusing on their beneficial ownership registry on extractives, forestry, and plantation sectors. Uh, so that they could cut down on illegal palm oil plantations, uh, again, to prevent climate change. Uh, I know I'm, I'm a bit, I think I have two minutes left um, to share, but I'll, I'll close this out by saying that, you know, where possible, where we see the future, if we want to make open data, you know, real, uh, and um, we need more progress around this one, there are gains. However, there are, there needs to be one, where possible, we collect detailed data disaggregated by gender and geography across time and levels of government. Again, a huge thing to do, um, but something that we also see in our in our global report on health, where we recommended centralizing and making comparable data on health facilities, outcomes, reproductive health, etc. Um, the last thing I would say, though, here is apart from the importance of interoperability, the importance of international open data repositories and, you know, processes for data standardization, it's the importance of an active regional network in Asia Pacific, which we do not have. In 2015, there was an Asian open data partnership that's, that was established for, by Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand and Indonesia. I know we have a Thai, uh, Taiwanese government representative here. We don't have that transboundary network that exists. And if we want to continuously build the evidence base and advocate for open data, um, I think it's time that we dedicate enough resources and uh, energies to make sure that we continue to build and you know emphasize the stories that you know our wins and even our challenges. Um, and the last thing I will say, and I know we, I don't think we'd have funders here, um, but the importance also of development partners. Uh, development partners will also need in dealing with governments, and maybe government can also mention this to them, to emphasize the importance of and the value of open data to require governments to set targets in funded programs uh, that would contribute to strategic open data publication. Uh, including open data provisions in those funding agreements. Uh, and it kind of incentivizes that as well. Uh, and the importance of that in a time where we have declines in democratic space in this region in particular, and you know, being very frank about it, open data only works if you have that space to hold power to account and to ensure that transparency actually works. 
So we need, you know, all of these multi multi level recommendations to work multiple people working together to get uh, open data to be again so that we get governments to be open by default. So thanks so much. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you for mentioning uh, some of the uh, open data charter principles, <laughs> but also thank you for sharing um, an overall picture of the region and that you know uh, discussions like this are super important. So thank you everyone. Uh, and there are people still joining, so please feel free to keep introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, and our next speaker, and let me introduce our next speaker. By the way, Open Government Partnership. I, Ivy is from Open Government Partnership. I must correct myself. And also their Twitter is at OpenGovPart, which I'm more familiar with. So if I shorten uh, <laughs> the organization name, excuse me, and I'm sorry. Um, our next speaker is Benjamin Zhou, uh, policy researcher from Internet Society, Hong Kong chapter. Uh, you have the floor, and I believe you have co-host um, permission. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kat, uh, for introducing me. Uh, I'm Benjamin Zhou. Uh, I was the researcher for Open Data in uh, Hong Kong Open Data Index, uh, host at the uh, Internet Society Hong Kong. And um, today uh, we all, uh, we also have I also have a new colleague here, uh, Yanis, uh, because I'm not working for the uh, Internet Society Hong Kong anymore. Uh, if anyone want to uh, have a collaboration or have a talk with uh, Internet Society Hong Kong about our open data project, please feel free to reach out to Yanis. Uh, Yanis, are, are you here? Oh, yes. Yanis. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah, this is Yanis. Okay. Um, so uh, I will start my uh, sharing. Uh, I will have a slide. Let me share my slide here. Okay, here. Good. So uh, it, yeah, I know it's quite a lengthy slide. I will keep it brief. Um, so just to give you some sense what's uh, what's going on of open data in Hong Kong. So I uh, did a little bit of research about how the Hong Kong media uh, report the open data. So I look at the data sets which have all the uh, newspaper and the magazine articles and see uh, the popularity of the key term of open data in both English and Chinese. And it seems that uh, the story begins in 2011 and 2000, uh, 2010, 2011. And the, it peaked at around 2017, 2019. So, and then it's going down now. So, you know, just to give you a little bit sense of what's going on now. Um, so the story begins in 2011 when the government introduced this new uh, this pilot scheme of open data plan for called data.1, but which only holds, uh, I think, dozens of data sets at that time. And they make some little bit of effort to promote this platform. So that's how Hong Kong people start to know what's open data by this government initiative. In the meantime, uh, later, Hong Kong start to have an increasingly vibrant civil society uh, because in 2014, there was going to be a huge electoral reform that would potentially allow Hong Kong people for the first time to have a one person one vote to elect their city leader. So uh, a lot of groups were excited about the potential change. So a lot of civil society was formed, including uh, quite a lot of peop a few people with information technology background to promoting this, the whole open culture, including open source, open uh, data, and open government. So this is the uh, events, mostly hackathon I attend during that period. Uh, that was, uh, you would say, a good old days of Hong Kong's civil society. Um, so there are quite a few groups uh, specifically promoting open data or open government was formed in that period. There was Open Data Hong Kong, Code for Hong Kong, Open Source Hong Kong, 
and the G Zero V Hong Kong, uh, which borrowed the whole idea from uh, Taiwan. Uh, but unfortunately, in recent year, most of the, this group disappear for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's only one good stain, which is open source Hong Kong, and which is less uh, politically um, sensitive, I would say, I would put it this way. Um, at the meantime, the government also identifying the potential value uh, of open data and put some resources to promote it by the form of uh, hosting these uh, competition hackathons uh, in the last few years. And so when you look at the uh, history of open data in Hong Kong starting from 2011, so it start from the government initiative and promoted by the civil society. But uh, in 2014, uh, when 15, when the potentially uh, electoral reform fell because quite a few people was not happy with the screening process uh, the government proposed, uh, the civil society activity slowly fade away. But at the meantime, the government identified the economic benefit of open data and pick up the promoting open data. Uh, until 2017, uh, the government released this new uh, policy paper called Smart City Blueprint, uh, which include quite a significant part of open data policies. So uh, that's so from then on, the open data activity was more uh, government uh, oriented. So um, after 2000, so that's why you see um, the curve uh, uh, when you look at the figure. Um, so the momentum was still there uh, from 2017 and to 2019. Um, so uh, speaking of the motive of promoting open data, uh, as we all aware that uh, there are uh, motive to promote open government, government transparencies, uh, access to information, and also to see the economic part of that. In Hong Kong, the, uh, the catchword of the economic uh, motive of open data is a smart city. So when you search these terms, and you see the curve of smart uh, open data in Hong Kong are highly related to the smart city. Uh, why at the same time, the open government's uh, activity uh, was, still, uh, was always there, but less related to the open data movement. Um, so when you look at the media articles, uh, it's also the same situations. Uh, in the early days, in 2013, the open data were highly related to the access to information campaign, Why later in 2018, uh, it was entirely about uh, promoting smart city. So that's the context of open data in Hong Kong. Uh, speaking of our project, uh, the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter, uh, we start this uh, independent project called Hong Kong Open Data Index uh, in 2019 uh, with a purpose to have a third party assessment over the open data situation in Hong Kong. So we launched uh, three reports in the last three years. Um, we de developed uh, our standard indicators independently, referencing to a lot of international standards, of course, in including uh, international open data charter principles. Um, our standards are mostly uh, more technical, like machine readable, open formats, uh, API, et cetera, to evaluate the uh, data openness uh, in 16 different uh, aspects in Hong Kong. So we see that the best parts are uh, the public transport and the weather and climate. Um, and the worst part you see is about the government operation, uh, the judicial and safety business registration, uh, including the uh, beneficial ownership, uh, which was uh, has always been not there in Hong Kong, uh, similar to a lot of countries' the situation, as uh, Ivy mentioned just now. And also, uh, land and housing data uh, are quite of a lot of issues. 
Um, yeah, uh, we conduct two time, uh, two rounds of assessment. There are uh, apparently uh, some improvement in particularly in the uh, transport and the climbing and weather and other uh, science technology or economic related data sets. Uh, meanwhile, we uh, joined effort with the Global Data Barometer to look into uh, other issues of open data than the technicalities, including the governance capabilities and use and impact of uh, in Hong Kong. And so uh, they launched the results uh, last year. And we see that in Hong Kong, the data uh, availability compared to uh, one other 109 jurisdictions in Hong Kong uh, is not that bad, which uh, was ranked the 14th globally. But in the meantime, the governance part, which only ran the four, uh, 49th uh, uh, among the 190, uh, 109 uh, jurisdictions, so this is the weaker part. The problem lies in the government policy. The government does not have any uh, data policy regarding data sharing framework and data management. Um, to be exact, uh, in Hong Kong, it, the government is good at introducing implementing some uh, practices uh, to open up, open up data set in general, but very weak and doing things at the strategic level. Um, so that's the issue uh, of Hong Kong. Um, last but not least, I will talk a little bit about the situation in China. Um, so in China, uh, there is, well, the civil society is, is definitely weaker now in Hong Kong uh, than before. Uh, in China, uh, there are, there are not that many civil society groups uh, working on open data, but there are still some university and think tanks uh, trying to promote, uh, make a lot of effort to promote the concept of open data. For example, this is uh, the China Open Data Index, which uh, was created by a team in the Fudan University based in Shanghai to compare the open data, uh, to uh, conduct assessments of open data situation uh, in all the Chinese provinces. So uh, they publish a lot of high quality reports. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, there was an interesting trend in the local government of China uh, that they actually passed quite a lot of legislations regarding open data and later data governance uh, in general. So you see in particular in recent years, in particular in last year, 2022, uh, quite a few city like uh, 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 big cities like uh, you see Shanghai, Shenzhen and Zhejiang province, which is another uh, very uh, leading economy in China. They all passed some legislations uh, promoting and regulating using the public data. And I think uh, it's quite an interesting trend. I think um, the reason they're doing so is try to, uh, to, to uh, conduct some pilot scheme to, uh, for the state level legislation. And also uh, the, the, the Beijing, the central government, the state level, they have some law, but not about open data, but in the data security law, uh, they have some uh, provisions regarding open data. For example, uh, this Article 41 say that uh, encourage uh, that the government shall publicly disclose government data in a timely and accurate manner as required unless public disclosure is prohibited in accordance with the law. So that's the uh, uh, a bit simple uh, introduction of the situation of China. And of course, uh, the the issues we are facing, and, and of course, there are some achievements we have made so far in Hong Kong. Uh, thank you to thank you for listening to my sharing. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, that was uh, great to see the kind of historical timeline and to see that open data started in a more grassroots level uh, in Hong yeah. Kong, and then with the involvement of the government, there was uh, more activity there. 
Um, sad to hear that we are still behind on the policies, similar to what uh, Ivy was sharing. Um, but yes, hopefully this discussion will inspire more policy work, right? Um, okay, without further ado, so I will just um, kind of recognize that we are a bit behind on time. Um, my fault, the Zoom, there was some Zoom link uh, mishap there, apologies, but thank you for still uh, being here and joining us. Um, and so without further ado, once again, our next speaker is Amy Max Whitcroft, uh, Senior Data Strategist and Consultant, also one of ODC's uh, board members. You have the screen floor. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> Kia ora, everybody. Uh, it's great, great to be here. <clears throat> um, also, because I'm aware that we're running a bit late, I'm going to be very, very, very short, um, hopefully in brief, so to, to hopefully we can catch up a bit of time, because uh, we can always have korero, you know, conversation afterwards, I think. Um, so I'm based in New Zealand, um, uh, currently the South Island, North Island. I've been in New Zealand for like way too long, <laughs> over a decade, and working in the open government and open data space for a number of years now in various capacities, civilian advocates, you know, leading government um, initiatives around open data, all of that sort of thing in, in various sectors. Um, and I've been thinking about like, what to say and how to tell you because I, I can't necessarily represent for, for everything that's going on here. Um, and I've been slightly out of the loop for the last few months, just taking a sabbatical. But I think I think the thing to contextualize it is um, New Zealand's been doing sort of like a formal open government thing since 2011, um, and we joined as as, as a country the, the central government joins the Open Data Charter in about 2017, so so it's been a wee while. Um, the movement has had uh, a lot of staunch advocates, people such as myself. I'm probably like second generation open data nerd. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to first generation, because um, I'd only just joined the country. Um, but yeah, so it's it's been really strong. But I think what I've what I've noticed is that a number of the the the, the hardcore advocates and like open data nodes have to some extent like moved on a little bit on into other things. Um, the the government like the formal open data New Zealand situation was. Um, the program came to an end in 2020, uh, and I'm not aware that there's anything, you know, we've got an open data portal, like a, a centralized one, and of course, everyone's got then their own open data portals across central government and local government, but things have gone in, in some ways a little bit quiet. Now, that's not to say that these things aren't still happening, but I think that major excitement that you see at the beginning of any movement for maybe the first decade or so has kind of chilled out a little bit. Um, my hypothesis, I, I've got a couple of things I think that may have happened, but again, like, I don't know, because I've, I've not seen research on it, but, um, you know, a lot of the, the low hanging fruit has been picked um, in, in that sense. Um, I think also the conversation, it, it's, it's like a maturity journey with organizations, right? And, and movements is, and it's happening around the world, is moving from not just saying, not just talk, talking about open data, data as sort of a silo, but saying there's a wider conversation here to be had about data governance in general, um, and digital strategy, and data rights and ethics, and you know it's it's no longer necessarily just enough to like throw up a spreadsheet and then forget about it, right? That's there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it's like, what do we do next? And I think. I mean, this is that third wave of, of open data stuff. I'm not sure if y'all have read the report, third wave of open data. If you don't, it's like a personal Bible. Um, but also, you know, a, a lot of government departments certainly here are and have been releasing open data of varying quality and various varying amounts and things like that for, for a while. But we really do want to start seeing a lot more um, open publishing basically from science, I mean, that's that's open access, right? But like actually publishing open data, for example, with academia. Um, I was catching up with a friend about that today, actually. Um, from the private sector, that's a big one, because for, for obvious reasons, they tend not to want to do that as much. But really, you know, how can we get non-governmental organizations, as it were, to start adding to this open data part 
um because that that's how we'll generate just tremendous value from it but what does it look like you know are we going to have to form data trusts and then everyone goes oh my god <laughs> and, you know people start talking about competitive landscapes and things so i think that that's that's kind of what's happening a little bit but that being said um some recent examples of things is i i had a major government organization come to me who, who deal with quite sensitive data and go we'd like to start releasing more open data. Can you help? And I was like, yeah, totally. So, so those conversations are still there, right? It's just taking different people sort of to be in the right place. Um, COVID of course has disrupted everything for the last three years and has sucked out a huge amount of time and money and energy and things like that while we deal with, with that, that, that will tend to set things back a little bit because open data then becomes less of a massive, well, it's not a burning platform. It's just not, right? <laughs> People might be a little bit more concerned about other things. On the other hand, um, a great example of like the power of open data that that the, the general public could see, right? Not the, the nerds who really care about it, um, was we had these huge floods in the North Island about a month back, like massive floods. This is Christchurch earthquakes level of damage, but more. It'll probably take us a decade to recover from, from all the damage and the cost that the floods caused throughout the North Island. Um, and with like within the course of hours, I'd thrown up an Usha Hidi instance, which is um for crisis mapping, crowdsourcing stuff in crises. It's very cool and it's open data. Um, and just seeing as people started adding bits and pieces to that, and it caused a wider conversation of going, we've got all these agencies who and, and, and various community groups and things who are releasing information out into the wild, but it's not all in one place. It's not all coordinated together. So what could we start doing to prepare for the next time this happens and the next time and the next time and start doing that thinking now? So I think it's it's sort of coming back into um, play again in the same way that during early COVID, um, the open data conversation, there was more about open access and researchers sharing their information so they could generate the vaccines faster. So it's it's all happening. It's just a little less loud, but I'm I'm certainly I'm very far from um sad about it. I think the other danger though is just that we don't rest on our laurels and go, we solved open data. Now we don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> so so that that's just my little uh, sort of thing that I'm going to keep trying to to help people think about. But overall things are good. Um got some wins on the board, some challenges elsewhere. It's going to be the case with anything and then just yeah really really thinking about open data is kind of cool it's very cool but it exists on a spectrum of data and it can't be the be all and end all so what else can we do to really generate social value out of our data assets including maybe not collecting it sometimes <laughs> i won't get started on my like chat ai rant <laughs> um, but yeah that's probably about me i came in under 10 minutes yes. thank, thank you, you max thank you um yeah, really sorry to hear about the, the floods uh, down there, but um, good to know that disaster preparedness is on the kind of horizon and, and thinking um, in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker is Pru Chung, Director uh, of Open Development Initiative. Yes, uh, yes. Pru, you on the screen. Hi, thank everyone. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I just put some notes together about our programs, but I'm very inspired to hear about the progress and work around Asia and have the advantage of being the last speaker to take that all in and reflect on our own programs. And so the Open Development Initiative is a first and foremost a human rights project. So we actually started looking at human rights and uh, environmental governance particularly justice with marginalized communities. And our approach to open data came in after the fact, when we started to collect data and information and work with local communities on how do they advocate for their rights using evidence. And this was innately important. Our focus is in Southeast Asia, uh, predominantly in five lower Mekong countries, which are Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And we've since expanded our program across Southeast Asia and have programming throughout. But the real difference, I think, of our approach compared to what we've been listening to is a lot of these tools 
and principles of open data that people are promoting, they're great. But the constituents that we're working with still are not on board. The large population of communities where effective and available data and made accessible in timely manner to make decisions, life and death decisions, is still really underrepresented and not even talked about. Even in traditional mainstream development spaces where we sit predominantly, these discussions are not happening. And so the rest of the world is saying the third wave of open data, it hasn't necessarily started in these countries that we focus on. And I was at a conference recently looking at um, the Mekong issues, which is, you know, a tributary that traverses six countries, including China. And the topic of the agenda was how do we share data? How do we increase data availability to make better decisions around water management? And not once during that discussion to three day conference plus a fourth um, recap was open data mentioned. Not a single time. And you had uh, three government representatives from official, uh, from official development agencies who are part and members of the OGP. Um, you had bilateral government representatives from across the Mekong. China was not represented, unfortunately, but uh, Korea, Japan, all of the lower Mekong countries. Were, were there and they're not talking about open data. And you have to ask why. And part of the reasons of why is exactly what our previous presenters all, re all spoke about. The correlation with the lack of public procurement data, anti-corruption data, lobbying data, beneficial ownership data, all of this data is linked to corruption of sorts and investments in development. And the transition of these less developed, least developed countries and nations into the categories of middle income or higher uh, developed nations, they're all uniquely linked to unearthing inequalities in how investments are being made and development is being issued within Southeast Asia. And they're not made available because it is too risky. There's too much vested interest in how the economies of these nations are being run in terms of resource extraction to be able to effectively release that without collapsing governments on a certain level. And so I didn't intend to talk about that but the previous speakers led me into that. So that's why I, I raised this issue. Um, more focused on what we've been doing to counter this. So our focus has been looking at really building constituencies within civil society groups that we work with, predominantly uh, rural-based, marginalized, vulnerable groups who uh, know nothing about data per se. So we actually never mentioned the word data. And we have never done so since we started working in open data. We talk about knowledge. We talk about agency in effectively articulating knowledge around systems to be able to make decisions. And this uh, frames a lot of our Indigenous data sovereignty work that we're engaged in across Southeast Asia, looking at data governance and the way Indigenous communities can use data um, with greater agency to improve and strengthen their institutions, but also then to contribute to national states to actually put forth a more sustainable model on how to develop the, um, the country. Um, this work has now seen some success. We do have an agreed framework across 40, 40 plus different Indigenous representatives across Asia. Uh, so not only just Southeast Asia, which is fantastic, it will be released shortly, but the framework will be a living document and is the key difference between this document and the global Indigenous data um, sovereign uh, 
principles is that it is much more heavily focused on human rights and indigenous rights. The actual pre premise of it is how do you assert data governance to increase and improve access to self-determination. So that's been one of the highlights, I think, in terms of the progress on looking at um, increasing um, awareness around the importance of having data sovereignty in general. And we're using this model to scale with other marginalized groups, specifically around water. So we're launching a new project called Women in Water Governance, which is actually not a new project, I should say. It's a, a carry on from a pilot we conducted last year that looked at the inadequacies of having reliable access to data and information for women to engage in policy discussions around water governance. And so we are building a platform to look at how do they engage? How could they actually strategize and share knowledge to be able to effectively interject into policy discussions? The main concern with this platform and also with Indigenous data sovereignty is security and risks. So it was interesting to see the shift from Hong Kong's history to a civil society movement on um, open data and access to information to smart cities because the other application of smart cities is surveillance. And so throughout much of our work with indigenous communities and environmental defenders across the region is that surveillance and the collection of data to surveil human rights activists and environmental defenders is increasing. And they're using data, this data to perpetuate um, physical harms as a result of the surveillance. So the perpetuation of their um, persecution continues and, it continue, and it's been escalated, especially during COVID. And so these are real considerations um, of harm that we are trying to address in terms of building safe spaces for communities to actually not only just um, collect and gather data for evidence, but also safely do that without being targeted. So there is a vested interest in not opening up and releasing this data. There are circumstances where the open data charter does not apply and does not take into consideration how do we build governing frameworks that allow for this protection of minority or vulnerable communities that need to be able to collect data and information and hold it without openly sharing everything. Um, the other work that we've been doing is looking at data literacy and research. So we just released a new report called Mapping Knowledge and Gaps in Data Transparency and Capacity Building in the Mekong, which really highlights some of the challenges around the work that we've been doing. So I won't go into that. I'll provide access to that later. Um, someone mentioned that there was not a network on open data part, uh, open data across transboundary issues. In Asia, we actually sit on the Asia Open Data Partnerships, and I think that platform does have representation across Asia looking at thematic issues around data, um, what do they call it, data economics. And so being able to talk about open data is quite challenging in Asia. And so the network actually uses the term data economics, which has positive and negative connotations. But the I think we need to work a little bit more on visibility of the platform. But it is a, it is a platform which engages stakeholders across private sector, civil society, and government representatives to look at addressing how do we resolve some of these transboundary data issues to actually help progress society across Asia. Um, I can talk more about that later. I also engage in um, a network that's just formulating at, formulating at the moment, looking at AI and climate implications. And I think there's, in Asia, the focus, the siloed focus on disciplines is perpetuated by traditional models of science and research, but there's not a lot of crossover with thematic issues. And so I think this approach about looking about looking at how artificial intelligence could actually support um, and alleviate 
current world issues such as climate change are really pertinent um, in this day and age? And how do we build these uh, better applications of data uh, governance structures or data applications to actually contribute to social problems with the actual people working in social issues and development issues and not just within ourselves. I think this is a broader discussion and I, I would, as my key takeaways and necessity for this space in general to open up and start to really realize that we're still talking in silos and that we still we need to be increasing uh, opening these silos, being more cross-disciplinary, being more engaged with the actual people who are working proactively on the ground to counter anti-corruption, to counter uh, climate issues, to counter human rights problems. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. Thank you so much for grounding us uh, with that. Um, and of course, yes, I think everyone here in this room, uh, human rights uh, first and foremost, right? Um, please do share the network because I'm sure everyone here would be interested. That, that's very interesting that it's called data economics. Um, probably why, right? If you're looking open data uh, network or <laughs> Asia, right? Um, oh, yes. Uh, it's called open data partnerships and I'll, I'll put the link oh, in okay. but but they when they talk about open data they don't they don't mention okay. open data <laughs> it's okay, very so that, unique yes so that means it is um that's I mean a greater challenge for the rest of us I guess right to either adapt the language or at least slowly uh try to advocate for more openness in general um thank you to the speakers um, so much. Thank you so much for joining. And again, apologies for the 10 minute delay, but we still have time for discussion. So I'm so excited. I'm not sure if any of our uh, guests. So first, either if any of the speakers have questions for each other, that would be great. Um, but also if anyone uh, among the participants would like to share, um, I think we had someone from Australia coming in. Um, that would be Please do unmute and uh, show yourself. Yes, Stephen. Hey, yes, I'm from Australia or in Australia. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have a question. So um, regarding uh, extractive resources, I guess. So um, I've worked on two projects, one in Queensland, one in New Zealand, where um, you know, the government has put a bit of effort into uh, making data accessible around the extractive resources industry and, and you know, uh, activity. Um, those sorts of projects, are they, are they happening in the Mekong? Are they happening in developing economies? Are they happening sort of to, to show transparency in, in, in what's being extracted and who's doing the work? Uh, short answer. <laughs> no. Um, there are nuances for sure. Uh, so we coordinated the Asia Global Data Barometer with uh, researchers and, and both um, uh, ben, ben and Nikesh were the country reps for Hong Kong and, and Nepal, but we also coordinated for the rest of the Asian countries as well. And from my uh, bird's eye view from a regional perspective, the the governments aren't releasing that data because it's sensitive. They classify it as sensitive and please define what sensitive means in any context when you're talking about resource, you know, public resources. Um, corporations are not vested in releasing the data. And so there's a lot of movement around public disclosure in Southeast Asia, I would say, spe specifically in the Philippines, Indonesia. Um, but it's all civil society driven. It's not government. So it's a lot of it is civil society watchdogs who are publishing leaked data and information um, that, or, or researching data and information around resource extractions and publishing it openly. Uh, we do this. So our open development Mekong platform uh, functions with this purpose across the Mekong region. So you will find uh, mining contracts, land contracts on our platform. You will find uh, procurement documents. I think you will find EIAs even for Myanmar. 
Myanmar was the only country that I know of that is signatory in the Mekong to the EITI, but that fell apart after the coup. Um, so it's, it's really challenging. And so the global data barometer in terms of the way it assessed public disclosure of these assets looked predominantly at government issued um, government. So all of the country, government release. So all of the countries rate, ranked low. But if you changed the assessment and looked at you know, civil society actions, then maybe that figure would be different. Um, because it's not to say that they all don't, it's just that they're not doing it in an open fashion. So just adding to what Peter Rugu said, um, Philippines and Indonesia have government teams who are actually working on extractives more mm -hmm. because of the, I guess, the history for both countries where mm -hmm. there was pretty strong teams um, during the time that there were progressive heads of state uh, and administrations, and they were mm -hmm. able to kind of embed that enough within the um, bureau bureaucracy, if you will, so that it's somehow um, still there, although not without challenges uh, around civic space, not without challenges around even uh, ensuring public disclosure of data because they're now moving from extractives information to more on beneficial ownership information on natural resources. So there's uh, there are issues that crop up on selling the idea of public, o public open data format of these um, data sets, but also that, you know, the at other context, which is, you know, civic space, red tagging, um, attacks on activists, on journalists that are kind of, you know, it's it's all a, like a perfect storm, if you will, that kind of makes it more difficult in terms of navigation on how do you build that value proposition when your civil society is also um, having a difficult time making sure that this, you know, from transparency you get to use. Uh, so there's also Papua New Guinea, but that, that's also, again, a very mm. unique context, also much more difficult. Uh, they, have a, they have a commitment around it, but again, it's going to be a longer journey for them. Thank you both. Uh... Is there anyone else in the audience or among the participants who would like to share? Uh, Rosalind, um, I don't know if you wanted to speak. Uh, if not, I mean, we, uh, this is amazing. I'm so glad that we still have a few minutes to spare for discussion and kind of wrap up final thoughts. Um, Aki had a question in the chat and he- Oh yes, up. I think uh, Nikesh will uh, directly answer that. It's more to do with the open knowledge uh, Nepal's work specifically, and I think a bit more of technical <laughs> technical questions uh, there. Or even Stephen, do you have? Uh, would you like to share more about open data landscape in Australia? In, uh, from what you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I think my preamble would be very similar to Amy's, as in I'm involved a lot. But I think um, I don't know. I have a very myopic view because I have direct connections to certain projects. Um, but if I were to have a commentary, I think it would be that, yes, there are lots of open data programs jurisdictionally bound. They mature in alignment with the maturity of the government, the policy and the politics behind all that. Um, but they've kind of all raised to a certain level. Um, it needs more public pressure to raise them beyond that. Um, but where you do see quite a bit of good innovative work is around what I call open data products. Um, so the examples I gave around like the extractive industries, so certain jurisdictions might have those products, or they might do it around climate data, or they might do it around other things like flood data. These are all projects I've, I've been involved in, or watersheds. Um, and there's a good crossover between the, the, the public interest around research into certain sectors or domains, and the government's role as a regulator or as an impresario and sponsor of activities. And open data builds trust. So when those organizations set forth with maybe government funding, um, obviously they're going to go forward and say, well, everything that comes out of this program will be will be published and open, uh, whether that's open access for you know, 
reusable uh, research or just for transparency. So I think that's a really big area that's still strong. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I think a lot of things will be converging. Um, you know, the pace of knowledge operations uh, as they become automated on good data sources as they become more self-aware or knowledgeable, like semantically rich. Um, I, I think that kind of driver will drive many sectors. Um, um, and those knowledge operations are going to be re really quite disruptive. So, uh, you know, the concept of digital transformation that we've seen to date has really been around service redesign. But when the actual sectors that those government services or, you know, regulated bodies are servicing are massively disrupted, I think you're going to see like a, a level of digital transformation that we haven't seen to date. So. Uh, lots of access uh, issues as, as those things roll forward. Um, and I think now would be the time to be very strong for advocacy as, as we change those systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Okay, I guess um, we have four minutes. So wrap up um, uh, among the speakers. If you can, maybe uh, share some recommendations. Uh, I mean, I know you have each, but maybe just one from each of you, key takeaways, recommendations for, um, and this is obviously up to you in terms of um, the levels, but beginner, intermediate, and mature level open data projects and implementations. I know you're all working in different spaces, whether it's um, directly with data uh, or with governments, uh, working with governments. But yeah, what ad advice would you want to highlight that you think is still not often talked about, but is important? Yes, okay, and uh, Max, please start, thank you. Data governance, data governance, data governance, data governance. It's It it still begs my needle that a lot of, and I know it's, a, I'm not talking about the terminology, but the concept behind it is like, if we're gonna do this really beautifully, we could save ourselves a lot of drama down the line by doing that thinking right up front um, and then seeing really how much can we coordinate with each other? Because I'm sure that there are huge force multipliers in there as well. <laughs> I'm going to echo data governance, but I'm going to put in there um, equitable because one of the, I think one of the key gaps is you can have data governance systems and we, we specifically work on that. But if you don't have a data ecosystem that allows you to implement alternative data governing structures, and currently we don't, there are no safe models or models that allow for greater independence from states to effectively manage your own data independently. And so data governance, we can talk about this later, Max, because I don't know any examples where there are effective models of technology and data ecosystems that allow for communities to have this autonomy. Um, so I think more investment into how do we design data ecosystems with strong data governance, with strong rights-based approaches, with the autonomy to be able to circumvent um, state and security harms that are impacting people. Thank you. Uh, Nikesh, would you like to jump in to add to that? Or Benjamin, Ivy, and then we can, yeah, love it, love it too. Um, yes, um, actually I wanna echo the, the, the the data governance thing, and uh, I totally agree that um, actually just now in my sharing that I showed the curve that the, the, the discussion about open data fading away uh, since 2019 in Hong Kong uh, for a lot of reasons, but I'm sure this is the also the trend uh, globally as uh, other speakers also mentioned that uh, simply talking about open data is not enough uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of issue emerge uh, at the beginning of collecting data, and we do need to address all these issues uh, when we consider how to make use of the value of open data for the social good, for for anti-corruption, and other other purposes. Um, so, uh, we definitely need to look uh, bigger and. And to in even in terms of our advocacy and our research, um, our groundwork, uh, yes, uh, I agree in that. Uh, um, uh, even though for some 
developing economy may not have enough data to um, sustain a big data ecosystems, um, but I'm sure that when we uh, data play an uh, increasingly critical role in our world, our economy, so, so we, we, we definitely look, need put it into a bigger perspective. Next. Thanks, Benjamin, Ivy, um, Kesh. Uh, and Kesh. Um, yeah. So I think uh, like a lot of like things has been like already shared, and I think in terms of what missing, I think we when it when it comes about talking, I think we talk about everything, <laughs> uh, everything else. But yeah, definitely echoing uh, data ecosystem is something that I believe uh, need need broader perspective and like uh, like more resources in terms of like sustaining things, making it more inclusive kinds of stuff. So yeah. Yeah, I I I will defer to all the you know wonderful things that have been said by the other panelists. But one thing I would still want to see, and I know Pru, you mentioned you know the open Asian Open Data Partnership. I would really love for that to be you know active, a broader set of countries over there, and even um, any. I know a lot of you know about you know open data intermediaries and the different skill sets that you need to have and that layers of intermediation you need in a specific ecosystem, right? And I think having that diverse set of folks from your data scientists to your grassroots organizations to your you know political operators, like having that rich diverse set of folks connected, having that you know, group to lean on, uh, regardless of the specific context that you're in. I think we'll need to harness that again and make sure that the energy is still there um, because of the importance of the work uh, that you're doing and how lonely it can also be, right, um, in in your, your specific context. So just wanted to reiterate that too. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. I will reduce that to data governance, interconnectedness, human rights, um, and all of that really is embedded in the Open Data Charter principles. Uh, um, as Pru mentioned and grounded us, it is human rights first. So just want to um, emphasize that as well. So thank you. Thank you for staying two minutes longer. Uh, please stay connected. Uh, we will. Uh, you know, uh, post this on our YouTube, but also share it with the people that weren't able to join us. Um, thank you. And for those still here, I would, as comms person, I have to do this, but can I do a little screen cap of those who want to be uh, featured uh, and want to be on video? So I'm going to do that right now. Hello. Oh, you heard that click. Hold on. Let me do a better one. Okay, smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. That's a wrap. Um, speak to all of you soon. Uh, speakers, I'll ask uh, for all your links and compile it for everyone uh, later in an email. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. Bye.